Hi, everybody. Uh, we're back. Uh, thanks again for joining us. Uh, the next session um, is one that's near and dear to my heart, is democratizing healthcare with AI. Uh, and I'm pleased to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Daniel Rubin, uh, who will be moderating the session. He's the professor of biomedical data science and radiology here at Stanford and also uh, the director of biomedical informatics. So with that, I'll hand it over to Daniel and we'll get started. Great, thanks, Matt. Welcome, everyone. Pleasure to be here. I'm going to introduce uh, the session, which is entitled Democratizing Healthcare with AI. Uh, and I want to uh, thank in advance my panel, who will introduce, I'll be introducing them shortly. But I first want to give a quick overview of uh, this concept of democratizing uh, AI. What does it mean to democratize AI? We've heard this uh, a number of times. In democracies, in general, all people are represented, and that's the goal of democracy. And that term democratization in medicine is similarly applied, the idea being that everyone who needs medical care will have similar opportunities and benefits of all the available healthcare resources. And when applied to AI, the concept of democratization is all about getting AI related resources, and that will be data and algorithms particularly, into the hands of everyone. And Dr. Topol's uh, talk earlier this morning was really provided wonderful examples of, of the promise of AI if there is a sufficient democratization. And it, only, uh, it isn't only about getting your hands on the algorithms and equal access to the care thereby uh, from AI, but also to AI developers who need broad and representative access to data to develop AI algorithms. Uh, currently, that is difficult and Dr. Topol touched on that as well. But the promise of democratization of AI, uh, spoke, looking just at imaging, is that there are many, many applications. And again, Dr. Topol gave a wonderful overview of the benefits. And in this session, our talk is going to be focused more on the imaging domain. And at a high level, that can be broken up into what are called upstream AI applications. Everything that happens before the image is acquired, things like automating and improving scheduling, protocoling the image acquisition device, improving workflow and image uh, enhancement and generation. And then once the image is generated, it goes downstream to the physician. And actually a lot of AI development is focused on this downstream things like automated disease detection, segmentation, diagnosis, and future things like prediction and response assessment. But this is all the promise of what uh, democratization of AI can yield. And uh, our speakers today will be talking about some other exciting work in uh, applications such as these they'll be enabled by democratization. One thing I'd like to have the audience keep in mind is despite all the promise and hype, um, democracies in general are not necessarily perfect. Um, democracies in general, uh, non-medically speaking, uh, there are problems of polarization, uh, the need to promote diversity. There are many in inequalities that are challenging to address. Uh, there's certainly a lot of problems with discrimination and bias. There's tensions between uh, how authority is delegated or where it's localized. And um, there's a lot of spread of misinformation, uh, especially these days. And there are similar challenges in democratization of AI. Uh, certainly for developers, there's problems with clean training data and potential bias in the, in the data sets. Big challenge of generalizability of AI models. You heard about that in the previous uh, session a little bit, and we'll be hearing more about that in this conference. And then importantly, if you think you've got a good model because populations evolve, the models may not stay stable. And if you have an unexpected input to an AI uh, algorithm, let's say an image that wasn't representative of the kind of images that were used to train the algorithm, you could have unexpected outputs. And this, all this relates to well, how, how and when will clinicians uh, be able to trust the output? Do they need explanation? And how should that explanation be given? And very importantly, there's a lot of promise as you saw in the earlier talk, but there's also a lot of uh, challenges related around when can you uh, trust the hype? When can you rely on what an algorithm is saying? Could behavior be adversely affected? And that is the subject of automation bias. So in our panel, these are topics I just want people to think about as we're listening to our speakers, and I will be introducing them one by one. First, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Pang, who'll be giving a spotlight presentation in 15 minutes. 
And then I'll be introducing our other speakers who'll be giving quick lightning talks, seven minutes each. And uh, each uh, speaker, I'll just uh, say, just for administrative purposes, so we stay on time, you'll hear a warning bell at one minute. Uh, so for the audience, uh, that's just a, a note uh, to keep everyone on time. Uh, let me start by introducing our first speaker, uh, Dr. Peng. Uh, so Dr. Peng is a physician scientist. Uh, she is at uh, Google Health. Her team works on uh, increasing the availability and accuracy of care. Some of her team's recent work includes building models to detect diabetic eye disease, to predict cardiovascular health factors from retinal images, to detect breast cancer, and other uh, diseases. She previously uh, was a product manager at uh, Doximity and co-founder of Nano Precision Medical, a delivery uh, device startup company. She holds a bachelor's degree with honors and distinction in chemical engineering from Stanford and uh, an MD PhD in bioengineering from the University of California, San Francisco. The title of her talk is going to be Democratizing Screening and Diagnostics with AI. Uh, welcome, Dr. Peng. All right, thank you, Dr. Rubin, and thank you for having me. Um, let's see, is my screen up? Can everyone see the presentation? Yes. Okay, excellent. So, um, so uh, hi everyone, I'm Lily. Uh, as a financial disclosure, I am an employee of Google. Um, and uh, so today I'll talk a little bit about democratizing um, AI in um, screening programs. And I'm gonna start off a little bit with deep learning. I, this is clearly not a crowd that I really need to reiterate this with, but um, you know, it, deep learning is all around us. Uh, and many of the products that we have at Google and uh, elsewhere um, that billions of people are using right now are powered by deep learning. So, you know, products like Translate, which is shown here, as well as photos, Gmails, et cetera. And of course, uh, the technology has also been shown to have huge potential for many healthcare applications. Uh, so, for example, in eye disease, in skin cancer, or in breast cancer. And the best part is that this technology works in the hands of not just research scientists, um, but undergrads, business owners, and even high school students. So um, in the recent years, uh, because of this, we've seen a huge increase in the number of papers in the intersection of deep learning and healthcare. And given the adoption of deep learning based technologies in consumer products, as well as these exciting case studies in healthcare, one would expect that we would have a plethora of AI enabled products in the healthcare space. But of course, you know, translation into product has been quite slow. Uh, and so, you know, as always, why is this, why is there this gap between expectations and, and reality? Um, well, the translation of AI technologies into healthcare is really more challenging than it seems. So today I'm gonna cover three common myths or pitfalls, you know, starting off, us off on a bright note <laughs> in, um, in building and translating AI models um, and the pitfalls that might be contributing to this gap. So, uh, so there are three common myths uh, that I'm gonna go over. Uh, the first one is that uh, more data is all you need for a better model. The second one is that an accurate model is all you need for a good product. And the third one is that a good product is sufficient for, pay, uh, for clinical impact. Okay, so the first one, which is more data is all you need for a better model. So as Dr. Rubin alluded to in the intro, it's not really just the quantity of data, but the quality and the di uh, diversity of that data. So um, I'm gonna bring us back to uh, one of the first papers our group published in this area uh, in late 2016. Um, and this is uh, a paper where we talked about how we set out to explore if we could train a model to classify diabetic eye disease. And this disease is graded on a five point scale like many other diseases. Uh, and in this project, we worked with a lot of um, ophthalmologists, so 54 to be exact, to pro provide labels for about 130,000 images to train this model. Now, uh, I wanna point out here, uh, you know, from about 100,000, 130,000 images, we actually got 900,000 diagnoses. Um, and this is because we had a lot of disagreement around, you know, what stage of disease this actually represented. So um, this actually brings us to our first myth, which we will unpack a little, a little more, is that, you know, uh, 
that really what we really need is high quality data and an efficient labeling strategy rather than, you know, just more data, right? So there are diminishing returns beyond a certain level. Um, so in this paper, uh, there, there is a figure four that is actually my favorite figure from this, this paper. Um, I find it particularly useful um, because we went and tested what was the size of the data, that the data set size that we needed to train this algorithm um, with this performance. And what we found here um, is that while in general, uh, this more data is better. It really depends on how you um, uh, use the labeling uh, that you had, the labeling uh, resources that you had. And then at some point, this um, actually saturates. The performance of that model actually saturates. So in panel A, just focusing on panel A, we looked at how the algorithm performance varies with the number of images in the data set. So you know, the question was, what would happen if you use a smaller data set than the you know, 130,000 that we had used um, with performance on the y-axis and the number of images on the x-axis? And each of these dots represent a different algorithm that was trained on a data set of varying size. So we start off with a few hundred images, uh, and then we kind of use a full data set. And you can see here that the performance actually plateaus around 50 to 60,000 images. So this means that for this particular problem, you know, we could have gotten similar performance, uh, not having to have you know 130,000 images. And in you know, obviously every problem is a little different, but it does mean that for problems like these, this 50 to 60,000 uh, data set, you know, well balanced, obviously, would be a good starting point. Um, and so in panel B, we also actually measure the performance uh, compared to the number of images per grade. So the development data set that we had had an average of about four and a half labels per image. So we asked what would happen if the algorithm uh, to algorithm performance if you had kind of noisy or imperfect labels. So we then we then trained the models using a subsample of labels for the train or the tune slash test set. Um, and then so what we see here is dec decreasing the number of labels on the train set seemed to have rather little impact on performance, but the algorithm's performance did depend quite a bit on the accuracy of labels on the tune set. So the takeaway here was given the limited number of uh, resources, um, invest in labeling in the tune set if you had to, right? So this actually bears out in future publications uh, that we um, had from, this, uh, from our group. Uh, so then the subsequent uh, publication in 2008 uh, 2018, we used the same method and we were able to increase the performance from generalist, uh, so these are the green dots, to specialist level, which are the yellow dots, uh, using a pretty small tune set of a few thousand images and an and, and a adjudication process with retina specialists. Okay, so the second, uh, the second myth, which was uh, an accurate model is all you need for a useful product. So Really, you know, the thing that we learned here was it's not really just about accuracy, but it's also about usability. Um, and so building a machine learning model is really, you know, for the diabetic retinal, uh, diabetic retinopathy product, building a machine model was just one step in preventing blindness with AI. This model actually needs to be incorporated into a product uh, that's actually usable by not just doctors, but nurses. Um, and so it was critical that we study how AI can fit into a workflow. And so this is a picture of an uh, ophthalmic nurse in Thailand taking a picture um, and using uh, our product. Uh, so this is an area where our team is working, uh, actively working and to gather evidence here. So uh, as I alluded to in Thailand, working with some of our partners there at Rajaviti Hospital, we conducted a retrospective validation study to make sure that the model is generalizable and, and, and it is. And then in late 2018, we launched a prospective study to evaluate the performance and feasibility of deploying AI into existing DR screening clinics across that country. So Thailand's really interesting in that they have a national DR screening program, um, and this uh, fabric is already in place uh, for us to do this research. Um, so earlier this year, we closed a recruitment of about 7,600 patients, all of whom were screened using this AI algorithm in nine different sites. Um, and we're analyzing, you know, both not just performance, but really kind of the usability, um, both quantitative and qualitative. 
Um, and what we've really learned here is that the human center approach is is just key to building useful products. Um, we worked with HCI experts and user experience folks to understand the feasibility of using AI. Uh, and so the first thing that we did was actually, we, we had folks there mapping out each step in the patient journey from the time they presented at the clinic um, to the time they actually left. And then we actually followed on the referrals. Um, and this really helped us identify potential inefficiencies and bottlenecks as we were implementing the software. Um, again, this has nothing to do with the AI model. It really has to do with you know, taking the picture, uploading the picture, um, getting the patient uh, uh, moving through the clinic effectively. So we published a methodology in a recent paper as a part of um, uh, CHI proceedings. Um, and so, you know, we cover product functionality, but also potential workflows. And, you know, one of the interesting things that I think, I don't think we were, all, in retrospect, shouldn't be all that surprising, was, um, you know, some patients actually didn't want to get screened because uh, they were worried that they would have to take additional time out to, you know, visit another clinic. Um, uh, which was too far for them. And so some folks actually just didn't want to know that they were sick because even if they were, they didn't, wouldn't have time or the means to go to a central hospital. Um, so this actually brings me to the third myth, which is that a, even you know, that a good product, a, use, a usable product is sufficient for clinical impact because there are a lot of systemic factors. And so we really have to consider what the impact is on the system as a whole. And so places, uh, a place like Thailand that has a national screening system may be very different from a place like India that does not have a national screening system. Um, and so, you know, this is kind of what I alluded to is we could have the best product in the world, but if patients um, don't have access to it, then we really haven't done much good. Um, and so, you know, for example, one of the reasons that it kept coming up uh, that people could, couldn't show up for uh, their appointments in special AI hospitals was transportation and the logistics. Um, and so in India, you know, a trek to the hospital could take an entire day. Um, and so, you know, part of the part of the program was how do we bring screening closer to patients so that this is actually more accessible to them. And so, of course, you know, the last part is uh, cost effectiveness research. Uh, and that's really critical in adoption. Um, this includes not only the product, but how it should be implemented and to take into account the downstream effects. So, you know, we have to think about the cost of screening, but also the cost of follow up and the cost of treatment. Um, so a great example of this work is actually um, out of the Singapore, uh, Singapore Eye Research Institute, um, uh, led by Professor Wong and team. And they published a paper recently in Lancet that um, showed that their economic modeling looked at two different deep learning approaches, uh, automated and semi-automated, and found that, um, you know, uh, of course, compared to the current assessment, which is uh, human only. And what they found was that the semi-automated approach was the most cost effective, uh, more so than, you know, AI alone or human only. So it's really exciting to see this research coming out. And I think we're going to need a ton more of this uh, for uh, AI to really make a big dent in some of the problems we have. Okay, so in summary, uh, the three common myths in building and translating AI models. So the first one is, you know, um, more data is all you need for a better model. And the truth is, it's really label quality and ground truth is critical to building accurate models, not just, you know, more data. And the second one, an accurate model is all you need for a useful product. And here we think really about it a human-centric approach that is required uh, to build a useful product rather than an AI-centric approach. Uh, and the third one is a good product is sufficient for clinical impact. And here we really need to focus a little bit more on implementation and health economics research to really realize some of these um, big uh, opportunities that we have in AI and healthcare. Okay, and here are the references. And thank you everyone. Great, thank you very much, Dr. Pang. I, we're going, by the way, feel free to ask questions in your window as you're proceeding. We'll take questions at the end of the sessions. We're gonna move right on to our next uh, speaker, it, uh, Dr. Uh, Pranav Rajapkar, who is a fifth year PhD candidate in the Stanford uh, Machine Learning Group. He's co-advised by Andrew Ng and uh, Percy Lang. 
He received his bachelor's and master's degree in computer science from Stanford. His research is in building AI technologies to tackle real world problems in medicine. He was the driving force behind a very famous uh, X-ray data set called the Chestnut Expert. Uh, it was a system he built using the, the database. His long-term mission is to build AI technologies that will be used routinely for diagnosis, prognosis, and treatment of patients. As you heard earlier, he uh, co-writes the Dr. Penguin uh, site with uh, Dr. Topol. And he uh, is going to talk today on generalization challenges for transition of chest X-ray algorithms to the clinical setting. Hey, thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, so I'm in the Stanford Machine Learning Group where I'm advised by Professor Ang and Percy Liang. And uh, the work I'm about to share today is in collaboration with uh, Matt Lundgren. So in 2019, uh, we released a large data set of chest x-rays and opened it as a competition to the world of saying, can we build models that do automated chest x-ray interpretation? And we came up with our own baseline uh, where we trained a bunch of models and saw how well they perform compared to radiologists and what kind of accuracy they got. Since then, it's, it's been over a year and there have been over 140 teams that have competed. And now our baseline, which was fairly strong at the time is now 73rd on the leaderboard. So now the question to us uh, this year was, what is, are these models truly more general than the models that we were seeing in 2019? We know that back in 2019, we were able to achieve radiologist performance um, with these automated algorithms in control settings. But the real next challenge here is to see if these algorithms generalize to real world clinical settings. So today, I just wanna share with you a few examples of how these models generalize to challenges that we would want these models to generalize to in the clinical setting, talking particularly about three different tasks, TB detection, smartphone photos, and external institutions. And I'll walk through each of these. So the first one, the first question we asked was, okay, we've trained these models to detect a small set of pathologies. Will these models detect pathologies that are unseen in training? And as an example, models trained using large data sets from American institutions do not include tuberculosis as one of the labels, even though this is big global health prevalence in many parts of the developing world. And so here what we did is we said, let's consider consolidation, which is one of the outputs of the model as a proxy for TB. And let's see how we can do with zero shot learning with no fine tuning. And what we found was that our performance of these models was competitive with when models were directly trained on data sets that contain TB examples and normal examples. The other interesting finding here was that the performance on the Chexpert test set, which did not include TB, actually was a good predictor for TB performance on our target data set. So this was fairly interesting. This was saying if models are climbing on the leaderboard, we can expect them to climb on other data sets as well. So the second question we asked was something we've been chasing for quite a while, which is this idea that anyone will be able to pick up a pick up their phone, take a photo of a chest x-ray in front of them and get a diagnosis immediately. Now this is an appealing solution to scale deployment, which doesn't require plugging into a lot of different um, IT infrastructures that different hospitals will set up differently. And then the majority of the wor world actually uses chest X-ray films. But the key machine learning challenge here is that this performance drop that one would get with photos of chest X-rays hasn't been thoroughly investigated. So we did this experiment with the top 10 models on the leaderboard. We asked, let's apply these not to chest X-rays, but to photos of chest X-rays and see how the performance drops. And this is still an initial investigation and there's a lot of work to do here, but our initial findings were that the performance drop, although there is some for all models, is not that big. Most have a drop of less than 0.01, at least in terms of AUC values. Since then, we have thought 
wouldn't it be cool if you could train a model on photos of chest x-rays? And towards this goal, we recently released the Chex Photo dataset, which consists of uh, natural photos and synthetic transformations that are designed to mimic the effects of photography. Um, and if you're interested in this subject, I will direct you to our paper where we develop methods for generating a large data set here, 10,500 chest x-rays, which, uh, which we collect by both automated methods and manual methods of taking pictures of chest x-rays on screens. The third question we were interested in is in understanding if models would generalize to other institutions. So this is a well-known problem, not only just in machine learning, but machine learning for medicine as well. And specifically in the context of chest x-ray algorithms, it's been shown that older chest x-ray algorithms have not shown sustained performance when validated externally. What this means is we train on one hospital, we experience a drop on another hospital. But this is critical for safe deployment because we're not going to be training on every hospital that we might be deploying on in the future. So now this is with chest x-ray algorithms in 2018. There was work by John Zeck and others uh, that used a previous version of our model and showed that there was this drop. So we repeated this experiment, but with some of the newer models and we asked the question, how do they compare to radiologists on an external institution? And here you can see the models in red compared to the radiologists in gray. And we see that we have radiologist level performance across a variety of pathologies with zero fine tuning on a variety of tasks. I'll just end by saying, if you wanna look at any of these works and uh, look at more information, uh, you can find them all at our Stanford ML Group webpage and the papers also link from there. I'd like to thank Anirudh, Anuj, uh, Nick, Mark, uh, Jeremy, and of course, Professor Matt Lundgren for collaborating on this work. Um, and uh, thank the Stanford Machine Learning Group where I've been fortunate enough to spend uh, um, a lot of my time in my PhD. So thank, uh, thank you all, I'll end there. Thank you, Pranav. Thanks for the great talk. Um, a number of questions came in, we'll get to those later. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Dr. David Oyang. David recently completed a postdoctoral fellowship in computer science and biomedical data science under Dr. James Zhao and Ewan Ashley here at Stanford. He obtained his undergraduate degree in statistics at Rice University and his MD at UCSF and internal medicine residency and cardiology fellowship at Stanford. Within uh, cardiology, uh, he's been doing research, uh, AI research that he'll be talking about, uh, and he's implemented AI methods in cardiovascular imaging. He has a uh, startup, he's starting a research group that focuses on AI in echocardiography at Cedar sinai Medical Center, where he is now. And uh, welcome, David, for your talk. Dr. Rubin, thank you so much for the opportunity. I just wanted to first highlight uh, what kind of uh, Dr. Kohler and Dr. Topol is saying that, uh, you know, it's really kind of a unique opportunity to be at a place where it allows for training on both sides or being able to kind of uh, provide opportunities to learn about both the AI part as well as the medical part, which I think uh, Stanford is, is a especially great place to do. So first, um, one of the things that we, I think as a community, as well as kind of cardiologists, dermatologists, radiologists, or pathologists all seem to agree on is that there's something particularly special about medical imaging. Um, through Lily's kind of, or Dr. Peng's recent work, we, we've shown that there's additional value that can be obtained from the imaging that we see. And this is a particularly unique opportunity because deep learning allows for an unbiased approach to really interrogate that landscape. That said, much of what healthcare wants to do and much of what many of the kind of earlier speakers have said is that we're still quite far from deployment of artificial intelligence in healthcare. Outside of just healthcare, broadly speaking, uh, machine learning has a lot of challenges in terms of the ability to replicate things, the ability to identify when a model is and isn't brittle, and also the challenges of deployment, in which kind of, um, kind of Andre really speaks to is that it breaks silently. And I think that this is both challenging in healthcare as well as things like self-driving cars. Particularly relevant to healthcare is also the questions related to data. And I think Timnit really uh, speaks to this kind of very kind of powerfully, and I'll really describe a little bit, but a lot of the things or a lot of the aspects related to doing healthcare related AI 
has been, where do we get the information? What are the right benchmarks? Which data sets and training sets are the most important and relevant uh, data sets to use? And how do we make sure that it's, it's well represented and it's fair? This is something that's particularly relevant uh, as we kind of gradually see how models can have bias. This is something that actually recently showed up on Twitter, which was showing that generative approaches actually underlie or highlight a lot of the biases that can ha happen from kind of models that don't have an inclusive data set. So on the left-hand side is actually a picture of Barack Obama downsampled in which there's a framework to go from downsampled images to do super resolution. And similarly on the kind of bottom left is kind of a sample that I generated. But the idea is that in medicine, failure modes can be subtle. While we can identify faces particularly well, uh, that might not necessarily be as well when we generalize to chest x-rays, when we generalize to echoes. And uh, particularly in healthcare and in uh, kind of patient related data, broad representation is crucial. One institution might provide images that look particularly different in a subtle way that other institutions do not. And we know kind of from many experiences that extrapolation machine learning models is actually quite tough and is quite brittle. So this is what I would describe as a virtuous cycle. A lot of the recent gains in AI uh, outside of healthcare has been the combination of three things. Uh, ubiquitous uh, hardware in which GPUs allows for the opportunity to do parallel processing, open software that's especially exemplified in kind of kind of open uh, kind of opportunities to have building upon the advances and the innovations of others, and particularly in non-healthcare AI, the opportunity to share data. ImageNet and open benchmarks are something that really advances the field because we're really, it's no longer comparing apples and oranges, but the opportunity to compare uh, oranges to oranges. And this is something that's uh, particularly hard in healthcare uh, because while every paper describes an AUC of kind of 0.95 to 0.9, uh, it's really something that's really hard to compare when we don't know the underlying data sets. So, Earlier this year, we were able to publish a paper and we would actually assess video-based models to evaluate cardiac function. Um, but one of the most exciting things, part of a part of this project that I'm most excited about has been our work together with the AD Center, which kind of uh, Matt especially helped with in democratizing or releasing the data set underlying this project. I think that this was a, this is, we described as the EchoNet dynamic data set which in addition to releasing 10,000 echocardiogram videos, we actually also release the expert adjudications, the tracings that are used to train the model, which can be particularly laborious and expensive uh, to actually do yourself, which requires uh, kind of expert clinicians, uh, but also the opportunity to really both share the model, to share the data and allow this, or kind of to hope that this can be a benchmark that can be used for many researchers and for progressing the field forward. And in general, one of the things that I'll describe is while we really care about the machine learning workflow, and this is a standard picture of any kind of a paper being published, really the data sharing workflow is equally important and almost kind of uh, more important in advancing the field, particularly as we pre-process the data, how we pre-process the data is particularly important, but also is an integral key in which that allows for data that's already clean and it provides for places to benchmark and evaluate the actual algorithms. So as part of our data set, um, we actually used 10,000 echocardiograms from Stanford. We harmonized the resolution and the frame rate. We actually worked with the privacy office as well as the IRB to mask and de-identify uh, the images themselves. And we also convert the files to AVI files, video files, or uh, movie files, as opposed to standard DICOMs, because there's the risk of potential data leakage with private tags and additional information, meta information uh, that is available in the DICOMs. And we've also released the code to actually do this conversion. Another big issue, particularly with medical data sets, has been the question of clinical uncertainty. I think that through many papers, we see that clinicians don't always agree among themselves, whether that's kind of recent work in dermatology and pathology, or in our recent work in echocardiography, um, we do see that there is expert to expert variation. Part of identifying a data set is identifying what is truly the ground truth. 
how do we identify what is within human error in which we don't expect a machine learning model to be better than an imprecise or unclean data set? And what are ways that we can actually identify ways to standardize or harmonize the data set? And finally, this is also uh, work that's tremendously pioneered by a the Amy Center, particularly with Matt, as well as Matt's work with the RSNA. Um, we've really sought to identify what are the meaningful features and what are the meaningful ways to share the data. So actually on the left or the right hand side, I actually have an image of Jacqueline Thomas, which is particularly um, who's really been helping us release the data. But our framework is using kind of a data use agreement, having IRB approval, having privacy office uh, review, de-identifying the subject, but actually manually curating and identifying and confirming that there isn't any leakage of data before release. So I would say that I think shared data sets, I hopefully I'm trying to convince you is particularly important and is something that we hope to generalize to the larger public. There are many stakeholders that include the industry, medical centers, as well as patients. And kind of one of our general hopes is that we can actually allow for data sets that transcends or go past any individual center and allows for an opportunity to advance the field. Thank you, Dr. Oyang. A great wrap up message, the value of public sharing of, of data. I would now like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Gilberto Saraf. I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing your name incorrectly. Uh, he is a radiologist at uh, Hospital Israelita, Albert Einstein in Sao Paulo, Brazil, where he serves as the coordinator for research in radiology. He is an MD and PhD, and he completed his clinical training in thoracic radiology in Brazil as well. The title of his talk is Democratizing Healthcare with AI in Brazil. So thank you, Dr. Rubin. So I'm a thoracic radiologist. My name is Gilberto Scharf. First of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity of speaking to you. I'll talk about democratizing healthcare with AI in Brazil. So Brazil is the fifth largest country in the world. Uh, it has a heterogeneous distribution of medical specialists. So in the map, you can see the distribution of radiologists. In light colors, you have less radiologists. In dark colors, more radiologists. In Brazil, you'll find big cities like Sao Paulo, where it's located our hospital, which was ranked 38th in the world. But here, you'll have also remote areas like Xingu National Park, which is an indigenous reservation. This is a place where I went some years ago in a medical expedition. So very, very different realities in the same country. By the Brazilian constitution of 1988, health is considered a universal right and a state responsibility. In 1990, the unified health system called SUS here, which it was created. Uh, this system is publicly funded. It is comprehensive, provides universal access to more than 200 million people but it has large variations regarding infrastructure and human resources. So talking about radiology, many places still work with hard copies. And more than that, many places don't store their data. The data is lost. So I'll talk about two initiatives that we took part in. The first one is the National Storage and Artificial Intelligence Platform for Medical Images which is a project with the government, funded by the government, in which we built a vendor neutral archive where medical institutions could send their images. Different companies and startups could request access to the de-identified data and they can build their models, they can train, they can test their models and ultimately, what we want is that the primary care physician anywhere in the country will be able to upload medical images from his patient and then get fast answers from an AI tool to help in his process of decision. So at the suggestion of the government, we started with melanoma and tuberculosis for primary care and with Zika virus congenital infection for specialized care. So for the tuberculosis, 
we went to Clemente Ferreira Institute in Sao Paulo. This is a place that was founded in 1904. It's a national reference for tuber tuberculosis care. And we had there more than 2,000 abnormal radiographies, most of them TB, but also other abnormalities. And in the archive that you can see here, uh, hard copies still exist for around 80% of the cases. And here we are building an AI tool capable of detect lung abnormalities and to give us TB probability. For melanoma, we had more than 100,000 cutaneous lesions from a prior teledermatology project. And the idea here is that with a simple photo to have some triage and uh, the, the algorithm will be able to tell us if it's benign or potentially malignant. For those ones with suspicious lesions, potentially malignant, they will be referred to dermatoscopy kind of photos. And another algorithm will give us a score and the probability of melanoma. So we have a triage for the primary care physician and we have this, this other algorithm to help the specialist. And regarding congenital Zika virus infection, uh, we got 200, 200 cases from two isolated cohorts in different parts of the country. Uh, the AI tool will be able to map calcification distribution here in the CT, measure head circumference. And if you consider such a big country, people can measure stuff in different ways. So we will be able to have the measurements in a standardized way and also measure ventricular volumes. So here is a way of looking at calcification in, Z in a Zika virus congenital infection patient. So here we saw that AI can help being present in places where a specialist is not. The second initiative was related to COVID-19. So here you can see uh, Pakenbu Field Hospital, which was part of the public system, but managed by our, our hospital in Sao Paulo. And in March, we started to receive our first patients with uh, COVID-19. At that time, we saw that it would be a huge problem and maybe we wouldn't be able to report all of the cases that were coming because of the, the numbers that were coming. So at that time, uh, the AI of our dreams would uh, be able to detect the presence of lesions, yes or no, the extent of disease, would be able to classify by the pattern and it would be able also to integrate with clinical data, laboratory data, and contact tracing. But we knew that that was very ambitious and we would be very happy just to have some more, something to help us on work list prioritization and also uh, to be able to report the more abnormal first, followed then by the less, ab the less abnormal. Uh, here is a patient, uh, the, the CT of a patient with COVID-19, so we can see here uh, consolidation, we can see ground glass and the heat map. Later, we joined the team, uh, the Stanford team into another COVID-19 research -aton. So here we can see AI helping in cases of manpower disruption. So we have a system that works on the edge and uh, facing manpower disruption, this would be of great help. Uh, so in our view, AI can help democratizing healthcare in the diagnosis support to healthcare providers in areas that lack specialists and also in specific analysis for specialists. Also in places or situations where you have limited resources, AI can speed up healthcare delivery and can also help in work list prioritization. This is the team that worked in those initiatives and I'd like to thank all of them. Uh, I'm honored to talk on behalf of them. And I'd like to thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Scharf. Great presentation to hear what you were doing and you with your colleagues in Brazil, very important work. I'd like to move to our last speaker, uh, Azan Akte, who is a research scientist in the Healthcare Intelligence Group at Microsoft Research in Cambridge. He's also uh, affiliated research fellow at Imperial College London, where he obtained his PhD in computer science. He's been pursuing research in machine learning and healthcare, focusing on medical image computing, human-centered ML, and uh, clinical safety. 
Prior to joining uh, Microsoft Research Cambridge, he worked at Siemens in the research division and held uh, scientific lead roles in mid tech uh, and startups uh, based in London and in the San Francisco Bay Area. He'll be talking today on Project InterEye, Democratizing Medical Imaging AI. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Dr. Rubin. Uh, can you see my slides at the yes, moment? Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, um, and I would like to thank the organizers uh, for the opportunity to, to present our work uh, today. Uh, today, I would like to give a quick summary of uh, Project InterEye and, our, and share our vision for wider adoption of machine learning tools uh, in healthcare. And to begin with, uh, I would like to talk about uh, the projects uh, uh, we are uh, working on uh, in Microsoft Research Cambridge. Uh, MSR Cambridge has been working in machine learning for healthcare for uh, 10 years, uh, in particular the INRI project. And as of today, we have four main projects uh, in this space. Uh, the first one is uh, immunomics. Uh, in this project, we're collaborating with adaptive biotechnologies on decoding a patient's uh, immune uh, system response by analyzing blood sample and use this data for diagnostic uh, purposes. The second one is uh, around hospital care. And here we're focusing on uh, two important problems. The first one is adverse event detection, such as hypotension. And the second is related to resource allocation in intensive care units. Um, the third one is about mental health. And we're working with Silver Cloud um, on online cognitive behavioral therapy. In this project, we're looking at ways to help care providers to treat patients with anxiety and depression more effectively. And Finally, the project in Iraq, uh, which focuses on healthcare workflows that involve medical imaging. And here we are collaborating with Novartis Pharmaceuticals and UK NHS hospitals, such as Edinburgh's in Cambridge and UCLH in London. In Iraq, there are three main objectives that we are aiming to achieve. Uh, first, we would like to augment clinical workflows and make them more efficient. Uh, this is mainly to be able to cope with the growing demand on healthcare and also clinicians can spend more time and focus on their patients as Dr. Topol mentioned uh, in the previous session. And secondly, we would like to deliver precision medicine uh, to get better patient outcomes. And lastly, we need to understand how we can combine radiomics features with other types of data to change the way we do medicine today towards more uh, personalized medicine. Uh, I would like to talk about the approach we take uh, in our projects, and I believe this is one of the uh, key differentiating points uh, uh, compared to other uh, ML healthcare research groups. Uh, we take a multidisciplinary approach where we first identify the need in hospitals through a user study, and then look for opportunities where AI can be leveraged to make the workflows more efficient. And once we identify that problem, we switch our uh, focus uh, towards model uh, development and validation whilst involving clinicians in this uh, cycle. And at the last stage, once the models are ready for deployment, we look for options uh, to seamlessly integrate them uh, in the um, existing uh, workflows. But we see this uh, process as a continuous uh, uh, cycle. Uh, Image-guided radiotherapy is one of the examples uh, where we have been making a clinical impact. Um, I would like to give a brief uh, clinical context. The treatment itself uh, requires a manual uh, dose planning procedure, as you can see on the right-hand side where radiation oncologists need to manually delineate uh, uh, organs uh, for tens of uh, slices and also including multiple uh, organs. And this can take uh, up to hours. And there is also a clear demand to standardize uh, this procedure uh, to provide uh, good healthcare. And uh, in our projects, uh, we have been focusing on two particular applications in radiotherapy. The first one is uh, prostate uh, cancer and the second one is head and neck cancer. As part of our research, uh, we have been also exploring the clinical utility of these models and also how they could be integrated into the uh, workflows in hospitals. In the proposed workflow, as you see on the uh, top right, uh, when radiation oncologists begin their planning procedure, the contours are expected to be uploaded and displayed in their usual planning software. Uh, in this way, hospitals do not need to change their current way of operation. And I will talk about Azure Stack Up uh, in the, on my next slide. But additionally, we measured the time span to create auto-generated contours and benchmarked it against time required to annotate these images uh, from scratch. Um, as you can see with this uh, bar plot, uh, we have found significant time gains as you can um, uh, clearly uh, see in here. And uh, this clearly shows how AI can actually be leveraged in workflows uh, to save time. And it's also worth mentioning that uh, in a separate study, uh, we showed that the models perform within the bounds of uh, inter-observer variability uh, tested on external datasets. 
Um, we recently announced that uh, uh, in, in Microsoft Build 2020 that we are partnering with Azure Stack Up and Microsoft Healthcare Next. Uh, as part of this partnership, healthcare providers can use Azure Stack Up as an on-premise option, which comes with a similar set of features as Azure Cloud. In other words, uh, they can train models and use them for inference on their internal data sets as an on-premise resource. Uh, our aim here is to scale the adaption of AI segmentation models. Uh, before I end my talk, I also would like to briefly mention our collaboration uh, projects with Novartis. Uh, last October, uh, Novartis and Microsoft announced a five-year-long uh, AI partnership to discover and develop new treatment types for patients. Research teams in Microsoft Cambridge uh, are actively involved in these projects, and as part of our collaboration, we're initially focusing on three areas. First, tackling personalized therapies for the eye disease, macular degeneration. Second, cell and gene therapy, and third, uh, direct design. And as part of this collaboration, NRI team is jointly working towards empowering eye care practitioners with tools that can recommend personalized treatment plans. Uh, this is my last slide, and I would like to show you how the work looks like to a patient uh, with age related macular degeneration, also known as uh, AMD. And at the late, late stage of the disease, wet AMD severely impairs the central vision of a subject, uh, in particular elderly populations. And the number of people living with AMD is expected to reach 200 million uh, worldwide by the end of 2020, and increase to 288 million by 2040. So this clearly demonstrates the increasing demand on the healthcare system. And we need to respond to this demand by augmenting the workflows with efficient tools and also making these uh, accessible to everyone. Uh, here's the inner art research team uh, working on these projects in collaboration with our clinical partners. And if you have any questions or interested in inner art stack up services, please reach out to us via email. And thank you very much uh, for listening. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. IK. And now we're going to go to a discussion section. Please put in questions. A number of questions are coming for all our speakers. So I'm going to try and, since we have limited time, get a question to each of them. Starting uh, with Lily Pang, uh, I'm going to. I have two questions for you, and then I'll give one question to other speakers. Uh, first question is: What are specific difficulties that were encountered during the real-world implementation, and do you come up with some generalizable solutions that would go beyond uh, the I uh, application that you discussed? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, I think. Um... The, app, the lessons that we learn probably goes across um, many screening programs, you know, high workflow, uh, high volume workflows. Uh, so, you know, some of the things that we learned around um, having, uh, so one of the main things was having poor image quality, right? So uh, there are a lot of issues where uh, a teleretinal, I mean, or a telemedicine provider really struggles with the quality of the data that was acquired at the clinical visit. Uh, and so even having a check uh, so that that can be, you know, that can be taken care of when the patient is there uh, makes a big difference in um, not just uh, satisfaction of the clinicians, but the satisfaction of the patients, right? Imagine you spent through, you spent, you know, all this time going to a clinic and then, you know, you get a response like, you know, your image was ungradable, your mammogram was ungradable, whatever it was, you got to come back and, you know, we, you know, we have to do it again. Uh, that amount of frustration also really decreases adherence to these screening programs. Um, and so we see that there are actually a lot of um, downstream effects of getting this particular, even the image acquisition piece, uh, getting it wrong versus getting it right can really make a big difference uh, long term. And then the other question, which fits really well into um, the democratization uh, theme, is how do we handle, this is exciting, and if it works well, how do you handle the availability of AI given the diversity of socioeconomic conditions of people in various places around the world? How would we get equal benefit or access to the technology? Yeah, I think that um, that is a really good um, guiding question, I think, for a lot of the way that we work. So, um, uh, you know, it kind of, you kind of have to design it from when product design uh, from, you know, who you collaborate with from the clinics that you work in. So um, one of the things that our team 
uh, has tried to do is, you know, our first partners were in India and we were actually working toward a solution that works well within uh, that type of context. And then we've also worked with the national screening program in Thailand. We are working with screening programs um, in the U.S. that uh, largely serve FQHCs. So, I mean, I think the real the real answer is um, you, we can we can theorize as much as you know we want, but until you've actually implemented these systems with um, the end users, the target end users, um, it is it is hard to tease out some of the um, trouble or the conflicts or the barriers to getting care that you would not otherwise um, actually know until you've been in that context. So um, being pretty deliberate in where you validate and um, planning for that ahead of time, I think could help. I mean, I don't think it mitigates everything, um, but it could help there. Great, thank you. Pranoff, um, this might be a little bit outside of your area of expertise because it relates to legal issues, but a question came up about what is the responsibility of the system or the developer for detecting incidental nodules on chest X-rays that were taken for other reasons other than for screening purposes? Um, sure, I think I can tackle that question from some perspectives. Um, so maybe one way that I think about that is the following. Um, unlike a lot of um, image classification tasks where an image contains you know, either a cat or a dog or a single thing, um, in the context of medical imaging, we care about detecting uh, multiple, one or more pathologies that might be part of the same image. And one thing that we've seen in studies with uh, radiologists is that when there are more than two pathologies in a given image, sometimes one of them is picked up and one of them is missed. In fact, when we analyze where models are making errors, they're making most errors when there are most number of pathologies occurring simultaneously. So I think the responsibility as developers is to be cognizant of this, uh, of this failure point of these algorithms when there are multiple pathologies that coexist and then designing algorithms with that in mind. Um, and you know, a simple mistake that can be made here is designing such that it's set up like a multi-class formulation rather than a multi-label one, but there are lots of layers to this to make sure it works. Uh, specifically on detecting nodules from chest x-rays, um, there has been, there's been quite a lot of works showing that on uh, uh, especially small nodules, we're able to detect them or, um, or direct a radiologist's attention to those. Um, so I think there's definitely, there's definitely the possibility of improving detection rate with that. Um, and I think it's important to have a sense as developers of what the most important pathologies that we shouldn't miss are and what the ones that are less cl clinically relevant uh, that we're okay to miss are. And I think that comes from an understanding of working together closely with the clinical team and, uh, and determining sort of what is the cost of making uh, different types of errors uh, in these systems. And I think that'll be, uh, that'll be a big part of these systems and these design processes going forward. Great, thank you. Um, David, uh, one uh, person wrote in that uh, for most shared data sets, even if they frequently offer the best way to train robust models, don't allow for commercialization because they're public data and they're not meant to be used for profit. How, what are your thoughts about how such shared data sets and models developed from them could be clinically useful if ultimately they, they can't be commercialized and only can be used for research? Yeah, I think that's a very interesting question. It's kind of how do we uh, use these models and these data sets? I would say that kind of even with the limitations that are currently imposed, uh, we see that kind of AI and healthcare is a very competitive, growing, and exciting field and the particular area of ultrasound that I'm interested in. Um, there are a variety of companies that are doing exactly that, developing commercial products. The intent of public data sets, and this is very much, it is, I think of it as a common good or a public good, is that we're really um, leveraging the opportunities that patients and academic medical centers provide us because we want to improve patient care. And I think that whether it's an industry partner, whether it's physicians or patients, 
our goal is to improve kind of patient care. And I think that that's specifically for open data sets, the goal is to improve the algorithms or improve the reliability of such approaches. I think that there's a very classical workflow for tech transfer from universities to commercialization. Um, but ultimately the intent of these open data sets isn't to do specifically that. I don't think that that closes the door for that, but it requires a different, uh, different legal framework. Great, thank you. Uh, Dr. Scharf, um, question came up. You showed uh, some interesting applications of AI in Brazil. How is it decided, how does one go about in your country deciding uh, if an algorithm is sufficient in terms of quality or accuracy to be applied clinically? So uh, this, this work, we, 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 it's not at that point. So I showed you a prototype of a VNA uh, and we put the images of those three subjects, Zika, tuberculosis, and melanoma, to prove that this is possible. We are building an AI tool, and uh, the idea is that the government will be, buy the idea, will scale that, so many hospitals in the, in the country will be able to send images, and then different, par different initiatives will come up on AI, and then the government will be able to judge which ones they believe are genuine, they should gain access, and then they will develop how to test if it's uh, reliable, if it's accurate enough to put it to work. So we are not at that point, but we uh, understand that this is go going to come up at some point uh, in, in a later project. Great, thank you. Uh, well, here, sorry, were you gonna say more? No, uh, welcome. Okay, uh, I have a question from a, a, an audience viewer for uh, Ozan Atkay. This is very interesting. What would happen if instead of trying to build an Uber model that works on everyone, we targeted models that perform well to population cohorts? Uh, is that approach better than a generalizable one? And can we have a paradigm where we're picking the quote right model for a specific uh, subgroup? to minimize the risk of uh, bias. Thank you for the question. Um, it's a very interesting one. Um, since I'm coming from machine learning background, maybe I can try to answer it uh, from that perspective. Um, so um, the models that we're building, uh, we try to ensure that uh, they're trained uh, with, with diverse set of uh, images coming from different uh, ge geographical uh, locations. Uh, and quite often, um, as some of you might also agree, that uh, when we when we train with diverse data sets, these models are tend to generalize better. Um, and I also understand the point that uh, if we train um, hospital or clinic uh, specific uh, models, that might actually be already sufficient. Uh, but then uh, we might run into the problem that uh, when we deploy these models in a clinical setup, um, how do we ensure that uh, which models uh, we need to choose uh, and target them for the right population? Um, that might also be a quite um, uh, difficult process. So from machine learning perspective, I think it might be more favorable to uh, come up with a, a generic uh, uh, expertise that can capture the clinical knowledge and uh, apply that uh, in, a, in a clinical setting. The following questions I'm gonna open up to the whole panel. And so anyone, more than one person can answer. Uh, wanna talk about the issue of your views on explainability. How important is that in your use cases? Is it critical for adoption? And if so, do you have a proposed best approach for providing that? So I'll take, tell, not in the technical aspect, but uh, as a physician, as a radiologist, I always feel safer when I know what's going on and how to explain things. So if I know how the tool works and I know what's, what are the problems and uh, what are the, 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 strong, the strengths of the tool, I always feel more comfortable. So it's very uncomfortable for me not to understand or not to be able to explain or predict how something is working. Uh, I'll, I'll let the others uh, talk now. Maybe I can you... jump in um, to, to add something to that. Um, I'm quite interested and the, the team is quite interested in um, designing uh, machine learning models uh, that can be uh, or user-centric uh, uh, machine learning models uh, instead of just solving uh, difficult uh, machine learning models uh, that can be used in healthcare. And uh, there are 
a significant body of work uh, showing the, the value of uh, human computer interaction in that regard. And the reason I'm telling is that uh, if we could uh, treat these models as a white box and like uh, make them more interpretable, uh, clinicians tend to uh, better understand uh, uh, the behavior of the model uh, when they disagree with the prediction made by the model. And that can be uh, exploited better uh, if uh, we can make the models more interpretable. And some user studies actually showing that um, the two, when they're when clinicians and AI are combined, the two can actually outperform uh, individuals. So in that regard, I see the value in that. I think that there's a lot of examples in medicine and outside of medicine where interpretability doesn't exist. And I think that that's even outside of AI. One example that people often give is the question of using anesthesia. We do it millions or tens of millions of times every year because there's many surgeries. But fundamentally, on a scientific level, we don't quite understand why it works, but we know it works, and it's particularly efficacious. And I think that another example would be something like Google Maps. I might not, uh, to the closest degree, understand why it works, but after I drive a couple times, I try to speed, but it always tells me the right time I'm going to get to a certain place, I have trust in the model. And I think that a lot of healthcare-related AI comes to the question of control for our echo work is can we have an intermediary that the physician can change so if they believe that is incorrect or if it can they want to adjust it but i think that it, from my perspective interpretability alone isn't the most important part but rather it's kind of precision accuracy and control so a related question i'll add on top of that which um, you bring up david which a, a viewer is asking is there's issues of trust uh, explainability, but then there's also other issues of um, infrastructure or systemic factors that need to be considered to uh, enable or for uh, AI to be incorporated into healthcare systems. What uh, are the panel's views of what else needs to be done for these things to be deployed within the infrastructure of healthcare systems? Are there factors other than just doctors uh, accepting or trusting the algorithms? Has anyone encountered that space yet of trying to get this into a healthcare system and identified other factors, systemic factors, infrastructure factors of what it takes? Um, maybe I can, I can start off there. Um, so I think a couple of challenges that I see in terms of getting these out in deployment settings that are related still somewhat to the technical aspects are uh, how reliable these models are. Um, if we can predict when they're making a prediction that they're going to make the wrong prediction or that they are being applied to a subpopulation where the model is not known to do well, then we need to be designing not only uh, technically for models to say, hey, this type of patient I really haven't seen before Dear radiologist, please do not trust me on uh, on this output here. Um, to even understanding from an interface perspective, what's a way to communicate that certainty? Of course, you can have a confidence interval, the, a confidence level. The model can say, "Hey, I'm ninety percent sure here." Um, but what does ninety percent versus eighty percent mean for a radiologist who's supposed to be making a determination. Looking more downstream, what is it supposed to mean for someone who's deciding whether to have an intervention uh, based on what the model is saying? Uh, so I think there are, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of key challenges about the reliability uh, in the same way that we think about not wanting a car to crash. Uh, you know, are we thinking about not wanting to make a really bad um, prediction for a particular patient? Anyone else have any, we have one minute left. Anyone else have any last minute uh, thoughts on that issue of translation? Okay, well, I wanna thank our panel for a very interesting and engaging discussion on democratization of AI issues. There are other questions that are coming in. Uh, we will address those in uh, the uh, public forum that Matt mentioned earlier. Uh, Matt, I'll turn it over to you at this point. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.